Okay, y'all, we are going to be starting uh, They Were Her Property today. This book is brutal. I just got through chapter one, and it has taken me out. It took me two weeks just to get through one chapter of 20 pages because of how brutal it is, so you are getting your trigger warning. May include violence, assault, and torture. Chapter one goes into... Uh, what makes up a mistress so it's entitled mistress in the making and so the behaviors that they exhibited uh, based off of the teachings of their parents is going into great details so I will give you the examples that they have given and then at the end of this we will discuss if we can handle it so chapter one opens with this little girl who's three years old. Her name is Lizzie Ann in North Carolina by 1847. And Lizzie Ann has this enslaved caregiver named Fanny. So Lizzie Ann is cool with Fanny for the most part um, until one day Fanny makes her mad. So Lizzie Ann was like, nah, we can't deal with this. Uh, little three-year-old Lizzie Ann threatened to cut off, Lizzie, uh, cut off Fanny's ears for not listening to her and making her mad. The author goes on to say this is common amongst white enslaving girls who were being trained to be future slave owners. Excuse me? Common practice? Excuse me. Their behaviors were learned from their parents' interactions with slaves themselves, and it became a form of training. Their parents will one day gift the children with the enslaved uh, man, woman, or child when he or she was old enough or when he or she was married. Enslavers uh, were more likely to grant slaves to their daughters and land to their sons. And this practice started as early as infancy. So for example, in 1836, Mary Fuller Knight was eight months old when she received a slave named Rose um, as her caregiver. And Rose was supposed to be owned by Mary and so was Rose's children. So what they would do is they would um, start the child's inheritance as early as infancy and make sure that the children born of the enslaved would also be their property as a further inheritance. So they were thinking long term. That's why breeding was a big thing during early colonization. It was future profits for them, and it was a sign of wealth. I know it's disgusting, isn't it? So the book talks about different forms of rituals they did to gift their daughters uh, different slaves. One was by drawing straws, which is a phrase that I probably will never look at the same. When a white enslaver would die, some of the family would get together and draw straws. And the shortest straw or the longest straw would be the deciding factor of who gets which enslaved person. I'm going to keep saying person because they refer to them as property. So remember when people like to say things like um, slavery, I'm sorry, the Civil War was about property rights and not uh, enslavement understand the property was people and drawing straws was like a game that these enslavers used to play with black people's lives utter disgust moving on enslavers would allow their daughters to assume the roles of instructors and disciplinarians to uh, the enslaved on the plantation. Uh, so they were in charge of naming practices. They were to teach uh, the enslaved how to address them um, as a form of respect as well. Get this. White enslavers refused to allow some slaves from naming their own children. Now I know um, on TikTok there has been um, conversations about the different ethnic names that black people have and how we have been made fun of um, for having ethnic names or names that nobody could probably pronounce. But they did that for a reason. So that if they were, if their children were sold, they'd be able to find them by having a unique name. 
So when enslavers would take away the right to having a name given to a child from their parent, that was also stripping away a form of dignity and a form of like a rite of passage. Also in line with infancy, enslavers would not allow black enslaved people to call white enslaved enslavers children by their names. They had to be called master or mistress. The goal was to have black people recognize the power of whiteness and the power it held as early as infancy. Like letting them know you are inferior to this white infant who can't even defend themselves. If an enslaved person would consider calling an uh, enslaver's child by their name, they would pay for it harshly. So there's this enslaved girl, uh, woman by the name of Rebecca Grant who refused to call this baby master a baby. So the mistress, the enslaving uh, woman, white woman, sent Rebecca to the store with a note. And knowing that Rebecca couldn't read, um, it was nothing to it. So Rebecca thought nothing of it. She went to the store to pick up whatever it is that um, her mistress wanted, returned back to the plantation, and turns out it was a whip, a cow whip. And so the mistress beat Rebecca to the point of her saying, yes, I will call the child master instead of Henry. So when people like to say things like, we're trying to gatekeep words like don't call uh, like sis and we don't want you to call us sis. Remember, there was a time that white enslaving women would beat the brakes off of black people for not calling their children master or mistress. Another enslaved woman gave her account of what happened uh, when you refused to call an enslaver's child, Mr. I'm sorry, master or mistress. What they would do is the enslavers, the mother and the father, would strip the enslaved person down to nothing and then allow the child to beat the enslaved person as if beating them them originally wasn't cruel enough. They taught their children to beat enslaved people when they wouldn't call them master or mistress. Y'all. Yeah. Now, when it came to enslaved children, the children of enslavers and the enslaved, at some point or another when they were growing up, thought they were companions until an enslaved child would upset an enslaver's child. Or an enslaver's child would recognize that they were not equal to the enslaved child. They could know as early as three years old that they were considered free as an enslaver and the people they enslaved were not considered free but their property. This was as early as three years old. The indoctrination starts very early. Now, some white enslavers would teach their daughters the art of disciplining a slave, enslaved person. So an example the book gave was there was an enslaved person who burnt the tips of a waffle and this upset the enslaver. And so in front of his daughter, he beat this enslaved woman for burning the tips of his waffle. And then to increase the form of torture, he poured hot candle wax on her open wounds to seal them. Now his daughter was witnessing this with no issue. Many times the daughters would witness the torture from their parents that was inflicted upon enslaved people and wouldn't even flinch because this was considered normal and they were taught that the enslaved people deserved this. Now another form of cruelty was the way that white male enslavers would realize that some enslaved people would never hit a white woman enslaver. So Lewis Cartwright was an enslaved black man who 
uh, refused to not tussle when it was time for him to be beaten. And he was uh, no match for the white woman enslaver. But the white male enslavers knew that he could he could throw some hands. So what they did was call upon the white enslaver's mother to beat Lewis Cartwright because they knew he wouldn't hit a woman. Because back then, any type of abuse from a black man on a white woman was instant lynching, instant torture. So there was less resistance. Speaking of torture and playing mind games, the way that they would entrap little children was even worse. So there was this plantation owner who believed that starving his slaves was the best way to keep his slaves in order. Starvation was a form of mental tactics. And so they would leave candy out for little children knowing that they're not supposed to take it. Well, one day, this little girl by the name of Henrietta King, she was an enslaved little girl, she was eight years old. She took the candy because she was hungry. And she had left it there for days and never touched it. But then one day, I guess, she just couldn't wait anymore. She was hungry. And she took it. And so the enslavers came back and asked her what happened to the candy. And she said she didn't take it. Well, the mother enslaver pinned her down with her legs pinned down and put her upper body on the child's head, pinning her head into the ground. While her child, the enslaver's child, beat the little so to this little girl, Henrietta King, who was an enslaved black girl, who was being physically beaten by her enslaver's uh, daughter, while the enslaving mother held her down and pinned her down, she ends up having real damage because the mother's weight was so heavily pressed on her head that it crushed the bones in her jaw to the point that she was never able to chew again. Everything had to be soup. All because she wanted a piece of candy. Because she lived in a slave owning house that tortured their slaves for eating. There were other examples of cruelty towards infants. Uh, one was this enslaver by the name of Polly who beat a nine month old to death because the nine month old would not stop crying. So much for this country being founded on pro-life. And then going, the book goes back to the cruelty of enslaving white children. There was this 12-year-old white girl who was walking and she saw this black man, this elderly black man walking, and she demanded that he stopped and tell her where he was going and on whose authority did he have to be out on the street. And if he did not answer her, she would demand that he be whipped. Sounds like a Karen in the making, does it not? You can be walking, minding your business, and then your freedom or your well-being be put at jeopardy because of your encounter with a white girl or woman. These behaviors that were seen by young white children were very common because the cruelty that they witnessed at a young age was a form of indoctrination by their parents. Most of us are familiar with the public lynchings and how family, white families would go out to these public lynchings and have barbecues and actually eat the people um, of the uh, person that they've actually lynched and barbecued in some cases, not all, but some. But did you know that white enslavers would bring their children to slave auctions to see the families separated as a form of how you deal with disobedient uh, enslaved people or how you make more bang for your buck. They also use this practice of selling enslaved people to buy wedding dresses as, and also wedding dowries. Y'all, that's just chapter one. The cruelty that is ingrained into white enslaving children at such a young age is something that I wasn't ready for. But you can see the similarities in the way that some cruelty being displayed against black people today takes place.